This hour brought to you by GCNLife.com. Live younger, look younger, feel younger at GCNLife.com. Hello, this is James Bond, the Godfather Soul. I feel good. You check it out, my man, Mike Siegel. Hit it, buddy, hit it, buddy, hit it, buddy. Welcome in. Good to be back. Nice to have you with us for another big program, and we are delighted to be here as always. The Julian Assange story continues. There no doubt will be some reference to that in Bob Mueller's release of the Mueller report, or at least the Attorney General's release of the Mueller report. And... uh, There's an underlying question. Is Julian Assange a traitor, a treasonous criminal, or is he a hero? It's interesting about his prosecution because it wasn't for what we thought it would be. It wasn't for publication. It was actually for some sort of conspiracy with Chelsea Manning, formerly Bradley Manning, to uh, put together a way of uh, breaking into the websites of adversaries. And so that's a much lesser crime and much tougher to prove. Assange's argument is simply that Hey, I'm just a journalist publishing. I did what Daniel Ellsberg did, what the Washington Post did. Ellsberg gave the Pentagon Papers to the Washington Post. They published them, and that was that. So, as the Supreme Court said, the Post isn't liable. All they did was publish it. Yeah, it was stolen, but they just published what was stolen they didn't steal it same thing that assange is arguing and that's why they're not going to charge him with that crime because the supreme court's already decided it we are joined by a gentleman who's going to give us some background about the julian assange case craig Wynn, who became one of the first dot-com billionaires when his company value america went public at the same time jeff bezos was simply selling books And uh, he actually wound up very quickly retiring to do other things we'll talk about, perhaps. But, Mr. Wynn, it's good to have you with us. How are you? Oh, good, Craig. Hi, Mike. Uh, Yeah, this whole story is is interesting. It depends on your frame of reference as to whether or not uh, Julian Assange is a a hero, or really someone to be respected and celebrated, or if he is a dangerous, uh, he can't be a traitor because he's not an American, but uh, a man who somehow made America more vulnerable. Uh, personally, I'm on the side of he's a, uh, he's a hero. Um, his, uh, the actual indictment against him is that he helped, uh, well, I guess he's now as Chelsea Manning. Uh, he, he, he changed her, his name, uh, um, with a password to get into another um, a subsequent government computer because Manning had provided um, WikiLeaks with some really damaging, um, and I, I don't mean damaging in terms of security, damaging in terms of credibility and character uh, information on um, on the way the war was being uh, waged in, in Iraq. And that's why uh, Manning, as a uh, intel officer, decided to share this as is that um, he learned something I did in my research, which is the um, U.S. Department of Defense, their go-to mode on most everything is to deceive, to lie. It's it's not their secondary choice. They, they just think it's somehow appropriate to mislead us, uh, the, uh, the American citizens in the world, about almost everything they've done. And, and, uh, and so this began with uh, Manning providing... 
helicopter videotape of a um, Apache attack helicopter with that uh, 50 caliber uh, Gatling gun in the front uh, gunning down, I think it was uh, 14 civilians, um, two uh, Reuters journalists, and a number of women and children. Um, and the, the commentary, the, the conversation between the pilots and the, those that had dispatched them, all looking at the same video, is was just so reprehensible. And um, and America, of course, had denied it, and, and it was, was a lie. It, we did exactly what what was claimed. And that's how this all began. And um, and so once Manning had uh, a, a bout of, of conviction that says, you know, these are, are lies that ought not stay that way, um, he got access to enormous uh, amounts of, uh, of international cables between various um, departments within the United States, particularly State Department, Department of Defense. And, and the thing that made them so uh, damaging not to security but to credibility is that American behavior around the world was, was reprehensible. We, we did a lot of really rotten things. As a matter of fact, one of those cables actually has America um, maneuvering to start the war that we're now dealing with in Syria. So there's a lot of a lot of things in them that that just oh were embarrassing to the country, which is why they're going after him. Well, it, it, the the some of the what you what you said has to do in Syria, I think, with Hillary Clinton and the um, whole issue at Benghazi, um, because that area was being used, they say, for transport of weaponry to other areas and it was um it's a, there's a lot more to it than what the surface seems to be so yeah the, the whole benghazi thing was was just it's been so poorly reported um and listen I, when it comes to hillary clinton and and uh in syria uh, there is there's nothing good to be said i, I mean i I am apolitical, so I'm, I'm not going to hawk for the right or for the uh, the left. Uh, I know uh, many on both sides and have been close to presidents, and uh, I've, I've never found anyone that I would say I respect that's held that's respected that's held that office. But um, you know, the Benghazi thing was that the um, CIA, uh, working out of the U.S. Um, embassy and uh, um, and other government facilities within Libya had come to the conclusion that they could befriend an Islamic terrorist group. And they had these guys over to play basketball and to dinner and, and all manner of, uh, of opportunities where they rubbed shoulders with them. And, you know, they were you know, seeing if they could, could uh, partner with scorpions to, uh, to find out intel on other scorpions. And uh, uh, Ansar Islam uh, turned out to be an Islamic terrorist group, and they they uh, used what they knew about the American um, I, embassy and other facilities there uh, to gain access. Uh, and so they were immediately recognized for who they were. And and the, the sad thing is what um, uh, both Obama and uh, Hillary Clinton did in the aftermath of it, where they were unwilling to acknowledge that this was... Uh, Islamic terrorism, and that uh, and that we knew it was an Islamic terrorist attack the moment it occurred, and we knew who it was that committed the attack because the people in the uh, in Benghazi had spent a lot of time with them. And well, so you know, I was going to say that uh, a series of lies. Well, it was, and it was done for political reasons. Bob of Gates. Course. We're getting off the point a little bit, but that's that's fine. Bob Gates, uh, the Secretary of Defense under several presidents. Mm-hmm. Wrote in his uh, memoir that he was in in the uh, office with Hillary and Obama, mm-hmm. uh, and and they were talking about what to what to politically do. They didn't want anybody to think there was still terrorism as a threat when Benghazi happened, so they tried to suppress it, and they didn't want to send any troops. They didn't want they didn't send anybody. No. Um, and he had asked about 600 times, had the ambassador, for uh, for support. 
over that summer never got it. The American Red Cross had pulled out, the British had pulled out, and we stayed and got slaughtered. Stay with us, please. You are listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. We are good to have you with us, Mike Siegelin. Craig Wynn is with us, and he's here as uh, founder of Value America. Very briefly, tell us about Value America, how you started oh, it, the, co- the kind of company it was. Ago. It was my, uh, I think, the third company I took uh, public, but it was a an, an internet retail company that, that actually did uh, a much better job of what Amazon does today, long before Amazon uh, did it. And just marvelous product presentations, great uh, relationships with manufacturers, and we created this this affinity way of uh, of shopping, so that the the store was literally created on the fly around each individual customer. So that if you if you had an affinity for your favorite, you know, your university sports team uh, or charity, uh, the uh, the whole store was designed uh, specifically with um, that look and feel, and made donations to uh, your your favorite cause. So it was in a full range of products, and we were the first just to literally carry everything you can imagine in terms of uh, product categories. That was now, were you, were you on um, on the internet, or, with the, or yeah, so did you have stores? Based, yeah, it was an internet based um, okay. retailer. I came up with an idea. Uh, having grown up in the retail space uh, and as a supplier to retailer, uh, you're probably familiar with Costco and uh, of, of course uh, the like uh, the, the and Walmart. Well, the the, the predecessor for both of those uh, were uh, I, inventions of a fellow named Saul Price. He created Price Club, which became Costco, and he created FedMart, which uh, uh, Sam Walton copied to create uh, uh, Walmart. And uh, he was a good friend and, and um, kind of mentor of mine, and, and so he was the, probably the most inventive man in, in uh, modern American retail history. Um, and having worked for him, I, I was able to apply a lot of, of retail strategies to the Internet space. And, and uh, unfortunately, those that valued the Internet uh, in terms of public companies had no concept of, real, of, uh, of, um, of what it is to, to retail products. Um, and so their metrics were, were pretty crazy. So it was a really bizarre world where you were... Uh, evaluated on criterion that made no sense, causing people to do things that made no sense. But um, nonetheless, it was an interesting experience. Experience. Let's go to um, this this whole question. We we got into a little bit about that uh, Benghazi situation, uh, which has a lot more to it than we know. Maybe yeah. more will come out. But uh, the real issue here today uh, with Assange is uh, at, at the center of it is the rightness or wrongness, as you said, mm-hmm. of, do, of doing what he did. Would you agree that the Supreme Court decision in the Ellsberg case, Washington Post case, really applies to this case, that he was simply, even if yeah. it were stolen material, he was simply publishing it the same way the Washington Post published uh, the Pentagon Papers? Yes, but that's why the U.S. did not indict him on uh, on the publishing of uh of what he found, because the publishing uh, did the the nation a greater good. You know, if you if you're interested in whether or not your nation is behaving in an appropriate way, uh, the service that he provided is uh, is well is even greater, I think, than uh, Edward Snowden. I mean, Edward Snowden basically said your your country is violating the Constitution and is spying on its own citizens. Uh, you know, that's extraordinarily valuable information to uh, to know, particularly in a in a uh, representative uh, government. Um, so the U.S. government is is not indicting him on the publishing of the information, but instead on the way that he got the information and the second round of cables. It is alleged that that um, WikiLeaks assisted Manning in uh, breaking into the computer uh, that uh, had the um, international cables between the Defense Department and the uh, State Department. With um, with him having done that, excuse me, there was going to be obviously 
a political reaction. Correct. Uh, first, the president said, uh, bring it on, WikiLeaks, during the campaign. Then he Oh, he loved said, WikiLeaks. He just came back to him and said, I love WikiLeaks. Right, and then he said recently that he didn't really know much about them. I guess he, <laughs> he said, I guess he knew he knew what he read in the paper about them. I guess, but um, yeah, then that was that. But um, I mean, uh, 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 Julian Assange sees himself as as an heroic figure, uh, as as somebody I think he should. As, as and, and tell us why. Uh, the same reason that Edward Snowden should see himself as a heroic figure, and any time that somebody has the courage. Uh, and the wherewithal to expose malfeasance of the degree that the U.S. government has been engaged in uh, and provides people with information where they are now empowered to make intelligent decisions. Um, that kind of an individual is, is rare, and, and, they, and they do so at, at great personal sacrifice. So, I mean, there's nothing. It's just like the, uh, the uh, Clinton emails that uh, WikiLeaks released. Knowing what was actually being said when the microphones weren't turned on and the cameras weren't turned on uh, was very helpful for the American people to make a decision as to who they were going to vote for. And to claim that, that WikiLeaks was somehow responsible for destroying the candidacy of Hillary Clinton is nonsense because all they did was release what she wrote. Well, you know, I, I, you write stuff that's that's stupid and embarrassing. You ought not complain that yeah. that people are reading it. I, I no, I agree with you. But the the the, the, the two sides of that are going to be this: uh, WikiLeaks is going to say exactly what you said. Listen, mm-hmm. you Hillary or mm-hmm. John Podesta or whoever wrote this stupid stuff. Right. Uh, and if you want to write that and make yourself vulnerable to it being released, that's your problem. The right. other side of the coin would be that they would ex- that they would expect that it would be secure, that it would be private, and that somebody would not come in and hack or steal it. So, uh, in other words, because we say things in private, I'm sure you have, I'm sure I have, I'm sure everybody has. Um, look, sometimes you might say to yourself, I'd like to kill that. My mother used to say that to me. I'd like to kill you. You're, you're, a, you're a public uh, figure because of your program. If you are writing to people as part of your job as, uh, uh, as a host of a talk show, then what you write, what you say, uh, uh, is fair game for people to know. What you say to, to uh, in your family and your private life is not. Right. And so if you're going to run for public office like the president of the United States, what you say in your emails, uh, you don't have a right to privacy then. I mean, you really don't. You have a right to privacy if you're talking to your daughter but not uh, when you're talking to colleagues in your party uh, about what strategy you're going to deploy if you're running for public office. No, I I hear you. And and absolutely, we're going to get to a break here, but I'll just say this, that uh, and maybe we can cover this on the other side. She destroyed 33,000 emails that had been subpoenaed. They destroyed uh, laptops and iPhones and iPads with with the material on them. She bleach bit a server. Um, if that's if you want to talk about obstruction of justice, I mean that was the epitome of it. So Correct. we'll come back and get into what's going on now. Um, as somebody who's been very successful in America, I'm sure you love this country, and I'm sure you may have some thoughts about what's happening with the Department of Justice at the top, with the FBI at the top, with James Comey, Andrew McCabe, uh, Weissman, uh, Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, all of those. We'll come back on that and much more. Mike Siegel in with Craig Wynn. Stay with us. Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. And we're back in. Good to have you with us. Mike Siegel here as we get back with our guest Craig Wynn, who is a very successful American businessman, lived the American dream. And... Uh, uh, before we get to what I was su- going to suggest earlier, let me ask you about some of these guys on the left, like George Soros, Soros and Tom Steyer, uh, a couple of other billionaires who seem to think uh, that they want left-wing radicalism, basically socialism, controlled by the government of the economy. Uh, and you see the Democrat Party 
is no longer the party of Hubert Humphrey, whom I'm sure you remember, no longer the party of Lyndon Johnson, for that matter, or Harry Truman. Um, they're way out there. What do, you, what do you make of where the Democrat Party has gone? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Uh, one of the most famous speeches ever, JFK's uh, speech, and I asked not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, you know, is the antithesis of the socialistic mindset of the Democratic Party today. Matter of fact, JFK's speech would be more conservative today than most Republicans would uh, would even speak. So the whole nation has moved hard left. And in fact, it's interesting that uh, that China, which we think of as a, as a communist country, and it is communist from its government point of view, but that they uh, have embraced free enterprise economically. And so that's the fastest growing economy in the world. And the United States has moved fairly hard left to a more socialistic uh, economy. And our economy has suffered as a result. And, you know, I, I listen to the rhetoric of uh, those like uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, and you, you wonder how a man who admits that he's a socialist, and I would say he's a communist, um, garners such a following among young and educated voters. And it's, it's astounding that they can't figure out that communism has just reduced everyone to the lowest common denominator and deprived people of their freedoms uh, while impoverishing them every place that it's ever been tried. And, and usually when it's imposed, huge uh, parts of the population are, are massacred uh, or are starved to death. So it's, or imprisoned. It's, uh, uh, no, I, I'm just absolutely stunned that we have created this entitlement mentality in America uh, where um, particularly the Democrats have gone hard left and the Republicans have become uh, sort of in the middle. What, what, how can you explain, if you can, I mentioned Steyer and Soros and others like them on the left who are wealthy. How can you explain that when it had to be a free society, a free economy, capitalism, that allowed them to do what they did? And yet they want to turn around and, and take control away for others to do the same thing. You know, I think a lot of that uh, falls into the idea of control versus uh, money. Uh, there's this confusion that uh, fascism is far right and that communism is uh, far left. And this actually falls right into that same confusion because that's really not true. Both both are capitalistic systems. There are three capitalistic systems, uh, fascism, socialism, and free enterprise. They all use capital, both the labor and uh, and monetary capital. Uh, uh, in the uh, in the production of goods and services, and the only difference is control. Who controls things? Uh, and in uh, both the fascist and the socialist system, everything is controlled top down. But it is possible to own that which is being controlled in the fascist system. But truthfully, that which is controlled. Uh, the person controlling it has more authority over it than the one that owns it. And so a lot of times these people become extraordinarily rich, and they seek the only thing that uh, their money can't give them directly, which is power. Yeah, I, so they become political to uh, to gain power and influence, and I think that's what the Soros has done. I think that's what the Kennedys did. Um, is they tried to transition uh, from money, which did not bring them the satisfaction they thought it would, to power and influence. Um, that's a very astute point, and I've I've often thought that because it's now about power for these guys. It's no yes, longer it about the money. Correct. I mean, the the, the money is uh, almost meaningless at, at that point. Right. Um, and, and now it's about having an agenda. But uh, but I, when you talk about the young people. I think that's scary. Um, Correct. I, I, and the reason I think it's scary is because I think, look, when you or I were younger, there was a certain kind of work ethic. Correct. I don't think that exists anymore. No, I think it doesn't. A lot of young people have made it in, in the in the IT industry and in, in, right. uh, social media, computers, all of that, which is a which is a fairly easy way to get it done in a society. I mean, look at Facebook. 
Zuckerberg, to me, is the most unimpressive guy I've ever seen testifying before Congress. Yeah, right. He, he's, right he's, on. he absolutely has right. no, no strength. All right. And, and, and of course, Facebook, which is enormously popular is really a dangerous site because it it causes people to participate in a very artificial realm. Uh, and it's, it is the place where so many of the conspiratorial myths that are just so damaging to one's credibility and ability to think uh, are promoted and where people are just enamored with, with videos as opposed to actually reading to uh, garner the evidence that's required to execute good judgment. And then you, you, you blend that with uh, what's happened educationally, where political correctness uh, just dominates the indoctrination of students, where it's, it's not what's right or wrong, it's what's politically correct. And what's politically correct is, is almost always wrong. And essentially, we've just made a country where uh, it's a crime to exer- exercise good judgment. So well, we you know, a whole generation that can't think. I, I can't, but they want to. Well, the reason it's scary is because these kids think it's a free ride. I, I, I mean, I've seen they should have free medical care, free education, uh, free housing. And they say I deserve free tuition. Yeah, look, you know yourself. I, I, let me give you an example of something. Yeah. I, I got divorced many years ago, mm-hmm. uh, my first marriage, and um, I had a friend who happened to be a minister. Uh, I'm Jewish. He was Christian, and that's great. And um, he said he, he was. I wanted him to do some counseling for me uh, as the relationship ended. And he he said, "Look, I'm going to charge you ten bucks an hour per session because if I if I don't charge you, you're not going to take what I say seriously." <laughs> and it's kind of like when you get the free newspaper in the newspaper yeah. box on the I corner. Agree with you. You may read it, you may not, but if you pay a buck for the New York Times, you better believe you're going to read it. If you're paid not to work, you're, you're, you're going to lose that drive, the sense of character, the sense of worth, the um, uh, sense of self-reliance that is so essential to well, isn't, isn't the left and, and being a, a net contributor to society. And isn't the left in that case, when we talk about dumbing down America, isn't yeah. there the attempt to mediocritize everybody? Yes. Well, you know, one of the things that we did... Could your company have made it today, do you think? Rhetoric, ...debate, all, all the, the tools that you need to exercise good judgment, to um, to be able to think rationally, um, that's uh, not what's taught anymore. It's, uh, it's extraordinarily sad what's happened to, to the American uh, indoctrination system as opposed to education system. Do you believe your company, would, have, if you started it today, would you have been as successful as you were? Not a prayer. And the reason... Is that it? And the reason I didn't start another business after it is that through the three businesses that I took public, the first business, about 90% of the people I hired were honorable. You could trust them. If your back was turned, they were going to still do the right thing. And then in the second business, it was about 50 50. And the third business, it was about 80 20 the other way, where 80% of the people had no sense of values or right or wrong or ethics. And uh, felt entitled, and and would stab you in the back, even while they're taking a uh, a salary from you. And so I, I just lost my sense of uh, of trust in the people that you could hire because I found that so few of them were trustworthy. We'll come right back. Sad note, sad commentary, but unfortunately, the way <laughs> the way it is, we'll come right back, and we're going to pick it up with uh, whether this country has gone through an attempted coup of a sitting president and what that means for all of us. Stay with us. Much more coming right after the break. Thank you for listening to GCN. Be sure to visit GCNlive.com today. Back we are. Good to be in. Mike Siegel here. Our guest is Craig Wynn. A very successful businessman, founder of Value America, two other companies that went public, uh, and is a concerned American citizen. So let me lay out a scenario for you, uh, Mr. Wynn, if we can. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've got a situation where, during the campaign, Hillary Clinton and the Democrat National Committee, Mm -hmm. both, and she, she, she was controlling the money, as you said, control earlier. Hillary controlled the money of her campaign, obviously, and of the DNC. Mm-hmm. 
money from both went to Perkins Coie, a very prominent law firm. Right. Uh, from Perkins Coie, it went to Fusion GPS, yes. which, which they paid to get dirt on Donald Trump. Fusion GPS is a slimy company uh, right. that goes out and gets dirt on people, mm -hmm. good or bad or credible or not credible. Mm -hmm. So they then hire Christopher Steele. Christopher Steele had been with MI6, the British intelligence agency, yes. at the Russian desk and uh, knew Russians. So uh, Fusion GPS gets some money to Christopher Steele. Mm -hmm. He then takes money and pays Russians to give him dirt. And uh, under oath at a deposition in London, Christopher Steele said, I can't verify any of this. There's a 50-50 chance it might be true. Uh, even And then that was used... That yep. dossier, yep. 35 pages, as you know, was used right. by the uh, Justice Department, yep. uh, FBI, to get warrants to go after Carter Page. Yes. Four, uh, four warrants, three months each, so a total of one year. Comey signed one of the war uh, one of the requests for a warrant. Rod Rosenstein signed another. A couple of other FBI officials mm -hmm. signed the other two. Uh, and they, they asserted to that court, the FISA court, that this, that this document was uh, a basis for probable cause to issue the warrants. So the courts issued the warrants. Many people believe they were hosed by Comey and by Rosenstein and by others. Then we find out that Lisa Page testified in secret testimony in the, before the Congress that, in fact, nine months of investigation of Donald Trump by the FBI before Mueller was named special counsel turned up nothing. There was no basis for anything. No problem. Not, any, not only no probable cause, nothing. Right. So then Rosenstein appoints Mueller. Mm -hmm. Mueller allegedly finds out early on that there's nothing, but he stays yep. around for two years, mm -hmm. has a report. As you now know, uh, there's no legal standard of conspiracy or collusion with Russia. Yep. Matter of fact, even in the summary uh, issued in the four page paper, <clears throat> the attorney general wrote, that uh, quoted Mueller saying that not only wasn't there collusion, but what, there were efforts by the Russians to get in the inducement of, of Trump associates to collude. And they wouldn't do it. They rejected it uh, proactively. So disgusting. So you tell me after all that whether there was a coup uh, attempt in, uh, like a banana republic in this country by the Justice Department, by the FBI. And then Loretta Lynch, by the way, meets with Bill Clinton on an airplane in Phoenix on the tarmac. And then she says it's a matter, not an investigation. He says that it has to be, uh, Comey says it has to be intent, when in fact gross negligence is all you need under the Espionage Act. What's going on? Uh, the truth be known, the least trustworthy, the least just organization in America is the Justice Department. The Department of Justice Justice is not trustworthy. And it doesn't matter if it's a uh, of a coup where they're trying to control who's the president of the United States, or if uh, somebody is being brought up for trial and the prosecutor is manufacturing, making up evidence against them. It is we have a serious, serious problem in this country, and it's from top to bottom in the Justice Department, and Americans ought to be alarmed. Uh, so this particular episode is very high profile, and it's extremely easy to do what you just did. Well, not really easy. It, you've got to be astute to do what you've just done, to put the pieces together and expose the Justice Department for being really uh, dishonest, inappropriate. It, it was a uh, unattempted go. And I'm, I'm not a, uh, as I say, I'm not siding one side or another with, uh, uh, with in politics. I, I, I know too many people on both sides of the aisle and have no respect for them. But I will tell you that, that what you've just cited in the Justice Department is not the exception, it's the rule. You know, I'm going to share with you something you may know about. I interviewed a guy named Christopher Fuller on this program. Mm -hmm. um, he was a partner with a fellow who knew Evelyn Lincoln, uh, John Kennedy's secretary. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew Evelyn Lincoln. I had dinner with her and her husband at one point. And um, she, it turned out that Bobby Kennedy had documents regarding the Kennedy assass his brother's assassination, the president. Mm -hmm. He turned them over to Evelyn Lincoln. He said that he wanted them to be secure, and he was confident they would be secure with her. Mm -hmm. She then left them in her will to this fellow who was like a son to her. Mm -hmm. 
And that fellow was partners with this guy, Christopher Fuller, who I interviewed, and he wrote a book about it. And the bottom line was, very simply, that uh, the CIA and other agencies didn't like the fact that Kennedy didn't want to go after Cuba, uh, didn't want to stay in Vietnam, didn't want to flex our muscles, which the agencies believed was the only way we could show our enemies that we meant business. And we, he wanted, they wanted him to stand up to Cuba and, um, and, and deal with it far more than he did. Um, with the Bay of Pigs, for example. Yeah, and, Bay of Pigs was a disaster for him. And uh, it was. And yeah. so. And quite th- frankly, we lost the Cuban Missile Crisis. We, we, we've we written it in the West as if we prevailed, but we didn't. Uh, we That was quite the capitulation. Uh, Russia got exactly what they wanted. Well, uh, to the point uh, that, and listen, I'm not, I don't know this, but, uh, and I'm not uh, endorsing it or not, but the point that Fuller made was that uh, it was the agencies that made sure John Kennedy was gone because he wouldn't play their game. Yes. And that's the, that, uh, w- true or not, they, they didn't like what he did. And that's the deep state that we're talking yes. about today. It goes back to then. Brings you right back to the first point we started with on this program, which is that is, uh, is Julian Massage a, a hero or a traitor? And I say he's a hero because he has made the information available to us to make the same kind of informed conclusions that you just have. Uh, fair enough. And that, that, that is bringing it around to, to its uh, conclusion, uh, kind of you closing the circle. I think you might be really interested in uh, Maybe we'll do a, uh, if you're interested in a program on it later. You said you're, uh, you're Jewish. I, I'm not actually Jewish, but I, uh, I learned Hebrew so that I could translate the Dead Sea Scrolls out of uh, ancient Hebrew into English. And yeah. what, what I found there is you talk about a cover-up. The English translations are horrid. I mean, they're, in many cases... They're the antithesis of what the Hebrew actually says. We'll do that. Uh, I know that uh, your agent uh, sent me information about that, and we will do that. But let me ask you, yes. do you think that William Barr is going to either have a special counsel or employ a team to investigate officially in some way with subpoena power to be able to go in and find out the truth and, and document what happened here. If there were, was there a predicate to the spying, in other words? Was there a justification for it? Will we ever find that out? Will there be prosecutions of people at the Department of Justice or FBI for bad behavior? I do not think so. And I, I think it's because of the fact that if the American people were to be given that kind of a window into the malfeasance of the Department of Justice, it would be very difficult for them to maintain the level of of credibility that they require to function. So I don't think America will allow itself to become vulnerable in that way. We would not like what uh, what is discovered. And and I think you're right. I know you're right. Uh, and, and, and intuitively, but the the issue is, does the country survive then? And what makes it any different uh, than a totalitarian dictatorship? If we have a deep state controlling things behind the scenes, pretending that we have a democracy, what what would and be the is, difference? And that is the case. That is that is the case. And uh, no, the country doesn't survive. Um, we're too far gone in too many different ways to actually uh, survive. I think it's it's essentially uh, extremely important that we understand what we have done that has gotten us into this fix. Uh, and we, and, and it's, there's a hundred things that we have done that, uh, including bankrupting ourselves uh, economically, destroying the value of our currency, um, and, including making it way too difficult for someone to start and prosper in a business uh, in America. We have done so many things that have been counterproductive, um, and dumbing down the uh, the average citizen such that that them voting is actually counterproductive. They don't know enough to vote. No, that's true. There are people who um, who don't. And, you know, there, there are, look, there are people who will cheer to get rid of the Electoral College in the Midwest. Why would you do that when the Electoral College is the only hope small states have? No, that's actually true. The, the Electoral College you know, doesn't make any sense in, a, in, a, in the world that we're in today. Uh, but but it does have the advantage of it causes each state to um, to, to have merit because it's winner take all. It's, it, but it, it also has the other side of the equation. If, if for example, if a conservative is running uh, against a liberal in the state of California, um, 
there's going to be no campaigning there at all. So California right. becomes completely Democrat. isolated because there is no chance under any circumstance that a conservative is going to carry the state of California and it's winner take all. And oh, therefore, there is no campaign there. This hour brought to you by GCNLife.com. Live younger, look younger, feel younger at GCNLife.com. Hello, this is James Bond, the Godfather of Soul. I feel good. You check it out, my man, Mike Siegel. Hit it, buddy, hit it, buddy, hit it, buddy. Welcome in. Good to be back. Nice to have you with us for a big hour. For the first part of that hour, we're going to go back in time historically and maybe question something that has been sacrosanct for millennia. And that is, of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which um, our guest has actually interpreted from the Hebrew after learning the Hebrew language. Craig Wynn is with us, a very successful businessman, now retired, and uh, I presume got into this as a hobby. Mr. Wynn, is that right? You got into this as a hobby? Uh, yeah, it is a hobby. It, um, it actually began um, right after 9-11. Um, I had been up in the air. I, I'm a pilot uh, and was uh, flying a friend of mine, Jerry Falwell, uh, the uh, guy from the televangelist of, uh, of uh, yesteryear, um, was flying him that morning, and he and I both knew uh, George Bush quite well, and uh, 9-11 was transpiring as we were in the air, and uh, did, we did our best to try to contact him to keep him from doing what he did which was essentially to say, we're going to uh, declare war on al-Qaeda, we're going to invade uh, Afghanistan, and shortly thereafter he had invaded uh, Iraq. And and so uh, when we couldn't um, persuade him not to do that, because I was convinced that should we do that, it would turn out as it has, which was, be, was a lose-lose scenario. We made a bad situation worse in both countries uh, and really accomplished nothing. Um, uh, at great loss of life and coin. Um, since I could not convince him, I said, well, the least I can do is, well, I'm going to go and talk directly with Al-Qaeda. I'm going to find out why they flew planes into our buildings. And so uh, I uh, met with Al-Qaeda right after 9-11, and based upon what they told me, I started uh, writing books. The first was called Tea with Terrorists, and the second was Prophet of Doom. And, and after reading uh, writing Prophet of Doom, where the... Um, where the Quran says that uh, that Muhammad was a prophet, and that actually the Quran doesn't say Muhammad was a prophet, but Muslims uh, claim that he was a prophet, uh, and uh, and and saying the Quran saying that it confirms the Torah when it's the antithesis of it. I uh, tried to juxtapose them using the English translations, and I, every time I study something, I said that it's impossible. I can't say that. Uh, there's no chance that it says that. That's a direct contradiction. Uh, and so I learned Hebrew and decided that the best thing I could do is to translate the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms out of uh, ancient Hebrew into English using the oldest extant sources. So I taught myself to read Hebrew, and um, I've written now, I think, 18 books on uh, on the subjects <laughs> Probably the most interesting I've ever done in my life. So yes, it's a it's a um, a hobby, if you will, uh, something that I do for personal satisfaction. That uh, based upon what I've learned, I've uh, I've freely offered every book that I've written. So they're all available free online, and you can buy them all from from Amazon without any royalty going to me, just for the printing costs. And it's it's been the most enjoyable and most rewarding thing I've ever done. Oh, that's that's uh, fascinating. Um... I've been to Israel four times and was uh, driving along with my driver, mm-hmm. and he said uh, we're driving down to uh, the Dead Sea. Mm-hmm. And he, as we're driving down there, he said, uh, "Oh, turn around right there. Look to your right." So I turned around, and there was a 
kind of the edge of a cliff. Mm-hmm. And it came down to the ground. And he said, see that big hole in there? I said, mm-hmm. yeah. He said, that was where an Arab Bedouin went in and found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah, Qumran. In 1948. And uh, he knew it was something unusual. So he brought it, I believe he brought it to Jordan, to a dealer. Mm-hmm. And it wound up now, it's, of course, in Israel in a museum. Right. But uh, tell us, uh, well, our time is short. Only of them have, like the Great Isaiah Scroll, which is the, the largest and the only complete scroll of an entire book. It's interesting that the most... The most prophetic of all of the uh, the books um, dates back to almost 200 BCE, and it's um, uh, it's intact in its entirety. So that's one that's in the the uh, the dome of the scroll there. Um, but all of the others have been, uh, after lots of intrigue um, and control, um, have been made available so you can you can read the fragments uh, online. And there's even tools that uh, make it even easier. There's a uh, there are books that that um, Take the the Masoretic text and the Dead Seas and scrolls, and they uh, uh, and they compare them, and they show all differences, so that you can actually use the Masoretic text up to the point of variance with the Dead Sea Scrolls, so long as you remove the Masoretic diacritical markings and go back to the original uh, 22 letters that uh, were part of the uh, the original alphabet. And so there's a lot of tools that you can use that that make the the process of uh, reporting what the Dead Sea Scrolls say um, considerably easier. All right, let me ask you to put it in a frame of reference here, and then you can take, because uh, we only have till the bottom of the hour, so I want to get this as much in as we can. Hugh Sconfeld wrote a book called The Passover Plot. Mm-hmm. Hugh Sconfeld was a professor of history at Oxford uh, in England, and he was a scholar, and um he wrote the book based on his reading of the Dead Sea Scrolls found in 1948, and he claims that Jesus actually, and I'm not here to defend this, I'm just here to pr- report it or deny it, I mean, I'm just here re- repeating what he said from his perspective, that Jesus actually contrived the crucifixion knowing he would die, um, believing that he was uh, divine, but also believing that he was fulfilling the prophecy of the Old Testament, and that um, he was uh, going to be uh, martyred, basically, knowing that he was going to die on the cross. And then Scott Feldman went one step further and said when they, um, I think they stabbed him in the side and uh, and, and some fluid came out, and or, or they stabbed him and there was something that put him to sleep. And that was how he woke up three days later by uh, the people with him. Yeah, he's put it, it, alone. Uh, let me tell you, let's, let's be a cut to the chase. The, uh, this will not go over well, what I'm going to say right now, with your Christian listeners. But the Christian New Testament is a disaster. Uh, there are over 300,000 known variances uh, uh, between the oldest manuscripts uh, dating to the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th century uh, CE and the, the text that they're reading. And there's only 182,000 words uh, in the Christian New Testament, and there are more variances than there are words. So this notion so, that it's the inerrant word of God isn't even remotely accurate. So if you're if you're trying to make conclusions by reading the Greek text, uh, you're you're hopeless. It, it just can't be done. Uh, there, it isn't credible enough. But what is credible is the Hebrew text, and in the Hebrew text. Pesach Passover, which uh, will be celebrated uh, sundown this uh, this uh, Friday evening, um, is the doorway to life. Matzah is the means to perfection. Bakurim, which is the next day, is the means to being adopted. Um, Shabua, which happens seven sevens later, is the means to be empowered and enriched. Uh, Yahweh, which is God's one and only name, didn't change his plan. He's only got one plan of salvation, and it's the seven Moed Mikra, these invitations to meet with God. Now, as for the individual that he calls Jesus, there was no Jesus. His name was Yosha. Yosha means Yahweh saves. And his entire purpose was to serve as the Pesach Lamb. Now, the reason that it's just utter nonsense, if you were to take the Greek text uh, and uh, and read what they say about what happened on Bakurim, which would be the first day of the week. There was no Easter. Easter is, uh, is named after Ashtar, that is the, the mother goddess of, uh, and the queen of heaven of the Babylonian religion. Uh, God does not have an Easter. If you're going to celebrate Easter, you're an abomination to, to the, the God who inspired the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. Now, 
me ask you to pick it up there when we come back. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to interrupt you in the middle. So let's wait. Come back. I'll just sure. open it up and then turn you loose, and you take the next ten minutes. Okay, I'd be happy. And just, and just lay it out with regard to the what you found in the Dead Sea Scrolls versus what the truth uh, is. What the truth Thank is. Thank you Stay for with listening us. to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today. We're back in. Good to be with you. Mike Siegel here. Craig Wynn is our guest. He is uh, a scholar, arguably, and certainly is, in terms of uh, uh, the the old uh, documents, the Old Testament, the rituals of... uh, uh, the Jewish faith, Christian faith, Dead Sea Scrolls. Mr. Wynn, go right to it. The, you, you basically translated the Dead Sea Scrolls. What were the discrepancies, the major discrepancies that you found? All right, let me ask you just one sure. question. You go from there. Mm-hmm. It, it, was Jesus divine? Was he the son of God? Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, first of his name is Yosha. There was no Jesus. The letter J didn't even exist until the 17th century. Uh, and, and Yosha means Yahweh saves. He was a diminished manifestation of Yahweh, but he wasn't. His birth was was uh, normal. Uh, his, uh, in fact, even the prophecy in Yahshua Isaiah just says he's going to be born the uh, the, the normal way, um, and he was. He didn't become uh, a diminished manifestation of Yahweh until the set apart spirit came upon him in the uh, Jordan River. Uh, so, the last three years of his life, uh, he. Uh, was a diminished manifestation of uh, of Yahweh. However, the whole notion of God dying is ludicrous. God can't die. Man can't kill God. Uh, that's why uh, Yosha cited the 22nd Psalm uh, to explain what was happening there when he's when he said, "My God, My God, why have you forsaken me?" He's he's not asking a question. He's leading us in the direction to find the answer, the best eyewitness account of what occurred on Pesach, uh, Matzah, and Bakotam in 33 CE, which was year 4000 Yah, is found in the 22nd Psalm, written by uh, Dode, David. And so if you want to know what transpired, read it. That's, that's why he cited the opening line of that, which says, in essence, the, the Spirit of God, the set-apart Spirit, departed. All that died on that upright pole was um, uh, was the body as the Passover lamb, and that body ceased to exist that night. That's what the fulfillment of Pesach requires: the the um, what's left over of the lamb to be destroyed in fire. The body ceased so, to exist that night, and that's the reason why, Mike, that the uh, on Bakotam. The celebration of Bakotam, which was in the first day of the the week in that particular uh, year, because uh, matzah fell on a natural uh, Shabbat, uh, no one recognized him. That was the common denominator. He had four sightings after uh, I, he returned from Sheol on matzah uh, to Bakotam. And all four, the common denominator is no one recognized him. The women in his life didn't recognize him, thought he was the gardener. They uh, said, don't touch me, I haven't gotten to the Father yet. Then he he goes from there to 60 stadia outside of Jerusalem on the road to Emmaus and meets with a couple of guys who witness this whole thing. They don't even recognize him. He says, you know, what's wrong with you guys? You have no idea who I am, do you? And then he goes from there after having dinner with them, and he uh, he walks through the wall into the upper room and... The guys that he had spent, the 11 guys that he had spent the last three years with, they don't recognize him. And then the next time he sighted, he shows up in the middle of a, of a boat in the Sea of Galilee, and they don't recognize him again. So, uh, the well, same I, well, let's get to the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, but was he, uh, was he of God? Was he here of God? Um, yes, Yosha was, um, was the diminished manifestation of of Yahweh. He okay. was here for the specific purpose of fulfilling Pesach, Mount okay. and Bukotam. All right, the so there is... Of the uh, of the seven Moed Mekre invitations to meet with God. However, for someone who is, uh, in fact, for anybody who wants to know God, is not the, not the person we should be focusing on. It's no David. David is the beloved son. David, we don't have a single word 
that Yosha said in the language that he spoke it that was written down within 200 years and maintained for us within 200 years of the time that he spoke it. With Dode David, whom Yahweh says, I am his father, he is my son, and he is right, we have a hundred psalms and 25 proverbs. Uh, and he is eminently knowable, and he's a vastly more insightful and important uh, person to, uh, to know. So did, I, I, I've got to have the focus because, is wrong. We only have three minutes. Did did Yosha, or as well, the Yosha, individual we call Jesus, huh? did he did he walk? Did he spend about three years uh, proselytizing? No proselytizing. It wasn't his purpose. His purpose was to fulfill uh, Passover, uh, unyeasted bread, and first fruits. All right. So and he that's did what he did. But he did spend three years. Uh, walking, marching, yeah, talking. In fact, his opening public address, which is called the Sermon on the Mount, is actually the instruction on the Mount. Basic, I mean, not basic, it says emphatically, you know, don't think that I came to do away with anything in the Torah of the Prophets. Not a single stroke of a single letter of the Hebrew letters that form the Torah and the Prophets is, is going to be annulled. You know, I'm here to, to fulfill these things. And anyone who would diminish the importance of the Torah is leading you astray. All right, we have two minutes, so tell us what in the Dead Sea Scrolls you found that the, in two minutes major highlights of oh, discrepancies. Let's just start with, uh, with the fact that Yahweh's name is, uh, is presented 7,000 times, exactly 7,000 times, and it's been erased all 7,000 times in English translations. Yahweh's name is replaced with the Lord, which is Satan's title according to God. How about that for starters? Pretty good. How about the Go fact ahead. that if you actually translate the creation account from Hebrew out of the Dead Sea Scrolls, what you have is a precisely accurate scientific depiction of what occurred, including the term Big Bang, which God created, including an expanding universe, and including the fact that as a witness to creation, six 24-hour days is exactly the same as 15 billion years of our time looking back. And we have absolute proof. Uh, that that uh, six twenty four hour days is in fact fifteen billion years. They are. That's, that's, it's not a different time. It's the same amount of time based upon relativity and the cosmic radiation from the Big Bang demonstrates it. How about the fact that that if you actually read the flood account in Hebrew, it says that it will begin with an upwelling of deep sea water. It occurred five thousand years ago. Five thousand years ago, the Burkle crater is uh, off of. Uh, uh, Mesopotamia put up a 500-foot wall of, uh, of deep sea water that uh, went all the way up through the Black Sea, which is the area that God wanted to uh, to eradicate humans with a nasalma, which is a conscience. Uh, and uh, we we find right at that time is when the Black Sea not only rose 500 feet but turned from fresh water to salt water. It, almost everything that is perceived to be a story and a myth has a scientific and historical validation when you actually read the original text. All right, so what you're, we're wrapping up here. What you're telling me is that we can connect the Christian religious belief about uh, God and, and the Jewish belief about God creating uh, the earth in six days to be consistent with the history of the universe and of this planet. That you can, hey, uh, you can... Actually, God is anti-religious. He hates the, the Judaism. He hates Christianity. He hates Islam. He is extraordinarily anti-religious. But what you can do is when you read the, Five seconds. Uh, these texts, what you find is that God is, is absolutely knowable. He proves his existence and he explains exactly who he is, what he wants, and what he's offering in return. Back we are. Good to have you with us. As we move right along, well, from the ridiculous to the sublime, as they say. And I want to thank Craig Wynn for a very powerful presentation. I think what he's told us is that uh, there is confirmation of a divine version of God having come to this planet, uh, whether his name was Jesus or Yosha. Uh, 
that's secondary to the fact of us having been here. So something to think about for sure, especially from those Dead Sea Scrolls. Craig Wynn, thank you for being with me. Thank you for listening to GCN. Visit GCNlive.com today.